when I first started thinking about the ideas of primal forces, and I did come down um, a month or so ago with my family, and I was very impressed with the exhibit. Um, and I, I found myself thinking about the title of it quite a bit, Primal Forces. And my first image, visual image, was always about some dramatic geological activity. Volcanoes, earthquakes, inhospitable and unpredictable landscapes, and activity that's basically antithetical to life. And yet, those geographical processes eventually evolved into a biological setting that not only permits life, but nurtures it, allows it to thrive. And so I would like to explore the many facets of primal forces, not just the destructive ones, but the life-giving ones and the regenerative ones. To begin with, primal forces are inherently creative. They may involve violent processes, especially in the initial phases, like those which allowed life to evolve on this earth, but even that violence gave way to vast diversity in mineral structures, plant forms, animal life, and this creativity, as any good ecologist will tell you, which we will hear about, um, it manifests primarily in cycles and regenerative, autopoietic, or self-creating, self-adapting systems. So, and also in artistic processes as well, as we've seen amply demonstrated. So, no, we want the other way. I think we're in backwards order. There we go. Um, so this Slot Quen Canyon quilt by Vicki Conley um, this is going to allow me to start with the setting for mineral life, um, the mineral setting for life. Um, here we see not merely rough materials, but sculpted minerals. Rock that's shaped by water, and we'll presume for our discussion that there's no life in that water yet. And you add to that the light from the chemical and gravitational wonders of the sun, and you have what human and other life perceive as not only beautiful, but a habitat setting. This is the beginning of life. Uh, in that habitat, microorganisms and plants can take root to be followed by animal life, and these forms interact with and change this relatively stark environment. So it's, it's a back and forth kind of setting. It, it introduces things, things come in, and then it becomes a, a dance of sorts for life to begin, to evolve, to, um, to, ver to diversify. Meanwhile, minerals, water, and sunlight continue to work on the changing landscape. And what is a slot canyon, if not only a work of art, but also a base canvas for other living cre uh, creations to evolve, right? Then, let's see. I also was very struck by the rose hip <coughs> quilt by Sarah Ann Smith. And in this one, we see a really intricate depiction of a ripe rose hip. Rose hips. Uh, if, if you didn't know, and most of you probably do, uh, they ripen in the fall. They're in season right now. And um, they provide food for both birds and other animals, including humans, although don't eat the seeds. Um, but they're also the seeds of life for the next generation of roses. Again, we see this cyclical structure of life and nature. A rose seed or any life emerges from the soil, soil that is also built by generations of microbes in partnership with minerals and water. As another life emerges, it grows, it adapts to its environment, it is perhaps injured in that life cycle, and then it heals. As it ages, it eventually dies and, de and decays. Every step of this cycle is a primal force. It cannot be held back. And as I used to say about my one-time toddler, she's 17 now, um, she and primal forces in general, they have bio biological imperatives that they must live out. It, it, it just, it's how life expresses itself. These forces and imperatives continue through the generations, evolving both short and long term, with beginnings and endings that facilitate more beginnings and endings. These cycles naturally tend toward equilibrium, enabling a continuing spiral of the reg regeneration of life and landscapes. You could even describe it as recycling, as it has been. However, if an event or force emerges that upsets that equilibrium sufficiently, the regenerative potential becomes endangered. So this piece, Global Warming, by Geraldine Warner, um, this is a, a quilted sculpture, really, and where we see colors that invoke the inhospitable conditions of volcanoes and ash, and we also see holes and tears in the form that I saw as, as a, a symbolic warning of the, that the structures, the systems, and the sculptures of our life and civilization are threatened by human actions working as primal forces that have thrown out our life-giving 
ecological equilibrium, throwing that out of balance. Without counterforces working to mitigate and rebalance the situation, this kind of primal force has the potential to arrest the cycle. And if that happens, the cycles can start up again, of course, but um, as with the first time around, it may take eons to do so. So we must look to the counterforces that can bring us back to a functioning and stable system. One of the interesting things about complex system is that not only are they adaptable, they will take every chance to regain equilibrium. And you can look at this in specific ecological niches as well as the larger systems that are built on the smaller systems. Um, and so as we start to consider primal forces, not just in art, but in our collective action within the environment that sustains us, the environment, incidentally, that God has explicitly told us to take care of, that it may then take care of us, as Chip told us quite beautifully. Um, and in that case, we need to start thinking in holistic terms, the whole quilt, as it were. Now, when I was an undergrad, also here at BYU, um, I remember wondering, how do people ever come up with original ideas? Because it seemed everybody's ideas were influenced or based on or educated by other ideas that they had encountered in their life. And in fact, I've since learned that in neuroscience that this is actually a pretty good um, conception of it because it is understood that all of our cognitive activity is based on metaphors, stacks upon stacks upon stacks of metaphors. Originally, from our earliest physical and emotional experiences, but then the environment that we are in as we developed, that shapes us and our thinking, and then we adapt as these autopoetic systems do, and then, so it's, it's this give and take, this dance again. And so, um, that, that's how we learn, that's how we think, that's how we come up with ideas and frames, frameworks and paradigms. All of these things are interconnected, and so how, how, do, we, how do we come up with these new ideas? Um, and where do these new ideas come from? How do our thoughts evolve, and, and where does creativity come into this whole question? So when I was 19, considering the root of this concept, I decided at the time that novel contributions to the world and, and other new ideas were like quilts. Quilts, which of course is the theme of this exhibit. You take disparate pieces that were made by others or were produced by others, whether it was the plant or the animal that made the fiber that you then make into a textile that you assemble, all of those things, they come, you put them together into a new arrangement, a new pattern, a new whole out of all these different pieces and one that you have created. That's, that's where a lot of this creativity um, plays out. And I think it was not wrong in that connection, um, though I'd like to add to it, for, um, because for one thing, quilts as material objects in cultures around the world were um, originally, and, and you know, unless you were wealthy, um, as was mentioned, something that you would uh, assemble from scraps of things when textiles were expensive and scarce. So the wealthy, of course, could could really dive into the artistic and, and some of the displays of wealth that some of those textiles represented. But um, there were other values being represented in most of the quilts being created. Um, for example, Shaker quilts were informed by simplicity and color choices and design, reflecting the Shaker community values of simplicity and, and um, non-ostentatiousness. Um, and then Sashiko quilts, were made by Japanese peasants, originally at least, who would continue to gather scraps of indigo dyed fabric, but bring wholeness through geometrical stitching patterns. So sashiko actually means little stabs. And so a lot of that, um, that quilting, they would assemble the pieces and then bring a wholeness to it by putting these geometrical patterns through that running stitch and, and many different types of patterns. Some would overlap, some would not. And so through these processes, you will have beauty and warmth, you will have valuing of scarce resources, connecting to the wares and stitchers who came before. Many of these quilts were intergenerational and they would take the quilts as the, as the quilts themselves would wear down and then you would add on top and on bottom, creating those layers. And, and we replicate that now with pre-made batting often. Um, but these, and, and garments as well. A, a lot of the Japanese sashiko examples are in clothing, padded coats and jackets and things to keep them warm as they worked. And so they were continually being patched and updated. 
And that, actually, that whole system sounds an awful lot to me like a regenerative life system where you're adapting and you're picking up new materials and, and interacting in your environment through this, this self-creation and these, these choices that we make. Um, as well as taking action to preserve the, what we have for continued life and well-being. So another addition is the idea that the whole can be adapted and expanded. I've discovered that quilts sometimes get holes. I don't know if you've learned this, but I've learned this. Either because the fabric has pulled and worn apart, or because the stitches have done that. And so we we, can't, we may decide to change the size or shape of the quilts for a variety of reasons, or we just want to fill in those holes, and so we add new materials and often new techniques that we've learned along the way. The quilts that I make now, and I am not prolific like the ones we've seen, um, but the ones that I make now, I've, I've, they're better. <laughs> I've, I've learned from my experience, and, uh, and they look better, and they hold together better, actually. So we adapt the quilts to our new settings. So, it takes us to this quilt, which um, this is called After the Warming, Permanent Winter by Jean Sreddy. So, going back to the case of responding to climate change, our quilt metaphor, this quilt is fraying and deteriorating. And we need to keep considering the primal force of humanity's actions that are disrupting our ecological equilibrium. The real danger, of course, is of our not doing as a healthy system would and taking every chance to adapt our practices and regain necessary balance and diversity in the life system that sustains us. When I first saw this quilt in the exhibit, it actually brought tears to my eyes because it's such a stark and poignant warning of what could happen, just as Rachel Carson did in her Silent Spring. If we didn't take the right actions that would preserve life, including human life, which is, as has been mentioned, deeply integrated into the eco ecological life that we collectively exploit in our Anthropocene era. So, fortunately, however, humans, like ecosystems, are resilient as well as creative, and we have every moment to do what we can to make the adjustments we need to to help regenerate wild and wildly diverse life on this planet. Now, I am not a scientist. But I am a citizen, and I am a fiber artist. As a citizen, I can, help do, I can help to promote and enact policies and practices that will mitigate and eventually undo the harm that we've done. Although I should note that the longer it takes to address these needs, the more dramatic the actions will need to be as, a situ as the situation becomes more urgent. Much of my other work has focused on cr finding creative ways to use what I have, consume less, create more, and enable others to do so as well. I've done this primarily in textile arts, partly because it is a high impact area. The textile industry is one of the most polluting there is, and because it's a creative activity that brings me joy, and also helps to build community. As I have taught visible mending classes, knitting, things like this, um, there's a real hunger for connection in the real world outside of the online virtual world. I have a bone to pick with Mark Zuckerberg because I don't think we need more virtual, we need more real. And so, um, so in this process, in my own practice, I've learned a variety of skills and taught some of them to others. And my main focus right now is to build a nonprofit that supports these local regenerative textile economies, just as I work to protect and value local watersheds and ecosystems. So with that as a background, I would like to answer some of the, ex the exhibit's questions using some of my own textile work as both metaphors and practices. The questions are, and they're on that, that big panel out there, what can you, how can you improve your stewardship over the earth? What other unconventional materials be beyond what you saw here might one use to make an art quilt? And what insights did you gain in visiting this exhibition? I guess we have to go back. Oh, there we go. Okay. This is a quilt of mine. It is not like the other quilts you've seen. <laughs> However, um, this was a quilt that I made with upcycled flannel shirts and sheets um, for my husband, partly as a nod to his childhood dream of becoming a mountain man. He did move from Illinois to Utah, so that sort of worked out. Um, but I also wanted to practice my value of putting used materials to new and artistic use. 
and we'll call it the reuse metaphor, which is a highly effective strategy, reuse, to decrease the impact of my material consumption on the earth. Also maximizing the use of existing resources and decreasing the demand for new. In a way, it's an unconventional material as well, since, as noted, um, upcycled quilts and materials are still pretty much a tiny minority of what's produced these days. I think we're going this way. Okay. So this year, I took a natural indigo dyeing class using the fruit vet method, and in my case, that meant primarily overripe bananas and pears, um, instead of chemicals to reduce the vat. The company teaching it offered an option of using not only natural indigo, which is both less impactful than the synthetic, but also supports uh, indigo farmers. And they had the option of using an organic cotton shawl. It's a, it's a very simple, it's a, more of a wrap, but it's, it's a shawl. And for the project. And so for me, this project is a metaphor for valuing quality materials and being willing to pay more for them and then using them longer, but also looking at the whole production system that I participate in when I buy something, whether it's fair wages for farmers, healthy livelihoods for producers and artisans, and supporting businesses that prioritize these values as well. Okay. This is an example of visible mending on thrifted jeans that I pretty well wore out. There are other patches not shown here. Um, but this particular mend, it's, it's the coin pocket there. And it was an experiment in um, using embroidery as mending. So there's no separate layer of patching material in here. It's, it's entirely the stitches. and. Some people will consider it a form of darning, but I reinforced around and through the hole in the pocket while trying to make sure that the pocket still was functional. Um, but I also wanted to look beyond functionality to um, the aesthetics of it, the, the beauty of it. And as some of you may have noticed, it's unfinished, at least for now. But I, I saw this as a metaphor for extending and preserving life as well as uniqueness and expression, and finding beauty and creativity in the imperfection of life. Um, some of you may be familiar with another Japanese term, wabi-sabi, which is finding the beauty in imperfection. Um, it's also an ever-evolving and ever-unfinished practice of, of finding that and valuing the imperfection in life that also leads to diversity. And in a way, um, and not to overstate it, but it is a kind, this metaphor is a kind of tree of life metaphor because it helps us to connect to a holistic life-giving center as we seek to nurture our planetary system. And then finally, um, I've spent about seven years teaching knitting and other practical arts to elementary school students. And for about five of those, I collected scraps of yarn from the children's projects. We use the same yarn for most of them, but in a huge variety of colors. And so when the, pandemic, um, when the pandemic started and we all were working at home, I found I had some time. And so I was able to take all of these scraps, I, I color sorted them, and then I broke them down into smaller pieces so that I could then recard, re-spin, and then knit them up into a shawl. It's a fairly chunky weight. I was figuring out a few things, but I did intentionally try to keep the different colors somewhat distinct so that it wasn't too blended so that you can kind of represent all of the children. I think of this as my school shawl, but also um, all of the different steps of that process. And I, and I chose a pattern that um, had a, a tree motif as well. And one of the interesting things about this that I have noticed in others as well is that by blending colors that were synthetically dyed, um, you actually start to get an effect of naturally dyed fibers because the natural dyes have so much more depth and shading and um, sort of a living nature to them. And, and so by recycling this, um, I was able to kind of represent that process. But um, this, this metaphor I, I saw as more of a metaphor for death and rebirth, where we allow new life to emerge. So those projects were dead and gone. The scraps, mo most people would throw them away. Um, but I made them into a new material and then into a new object. And this, um, 
This practice or metaphor of allowing new life to emerge is what we must do culturally and practically as we shift our consumption habits and let some of these die in order to let new ones emerge, as well as to allow our ecosystems to recover from our previous and current overconsumption. So all of these metaphors, I think, speak to the ways that I can improve my stewardship over the earth to decrease my consumption, to increase my creativity, to value and protect quality materials and the ecology that supports me, to create and preserve beauty and wilderness, and to allow natural cycles to support the emergence of new and diverse life. So the final question is, what insights did I gain from visiting primal forces? And I think my answer to this is how there is a growing awareness in human society of the interconnectedness of all life, and that that awareness is its own primal force. It's bubbling up between the asphalt and the sidewalk. It's showing up in businesses looking at the whole impact of their products and services from sourcing to transportation and energy use to disposal. It's showing up in mass climate migrations by refugees who don't have a habitable place to live. It's showing up in organizations that are empowering and educating citizens, legislators, and businesses, large and small, to think and act systemically with our collective long-term health in mind. It's also showing up in artwork that both replicates primal forces, destructive and creative, impressing our minds and hearts with their implications, their beauty, and their artistic skill. And this awareness of our interconnectedness is emerging and growing in our own minds and actions as we each consider ourselves as more and more of, of as realize that there's much to do and that each of us can do something and that the collective force of our efforts can be significant, even primal. Thich Nhat Hanh said that we are here to awaken from the illusion of our separateness. I agree with him. And I think that our interconnectedness is more than physical and social, it's spiritual. We can remember that there is nothing physically made that was not also spiritually made in our ecosystems, in our societies, in the earth itself. And that our choices and actions in the physical world have spiritual implications. Indeed, the physical, social, and spiritual aspects of life are also interconnected. And I hope that we can each find our own unique way of contributing to restoring wholeness on this earth and seeing ourselves and our creative value in the vast interconnected web of life. Thank you. <laughs>